So I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew 16. Matthew 16, we're going to be looking at verses um, 13 to 21. And uh, there is another text that we're going to be reading a little later on, so you might want to keep your Bibles close at hand. But about halfway through the message, we'll uh, look at another text. And here in this text, um, it's uh, truly uh, Peter and what Jesus says to Peter and what uh, uh, just the role that Peter is to play uh, it will be the highlight of, of the text that we are about to read. And so I just point that out to you um, so that uh, you can kind of recall that as we uh, progress through the message and uh, see what God has in store for us. So with the word of God open before us, let's just take a moment to pray again. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you have spoken life into all that is. And so, Lord, we seek this morning to, to see how you spoke life into something that is very, very familiar to us, but that we might see it perhaps again for the first time. And so, Lord, bless this uh, and your words to our hearts and to our lives, and may our lives be a life in response to the life that you breathe into us. In your name, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. All right, so Matthew 16, we're going to be reading verses 13 to 21, 13 to 21. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. And we'll pause the reading from the word here for a moment and pick it up again shortly. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the Garden of Eden. And we know that it was God's design to provide a place where he, the almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, where he could walk in the cool of the day with his beloved people. It was God's original intention to be with his people and to make his dwelling among his people. God loved what he created. The Garden of Eden was good. It was very good. But Adam literally translated as human, blew it. <laughs> he, that, that is we, rebelled against God, and God sent us packing. <laughs> Don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> but God wasn't that mean, and no, not at all. God provided for his people. He, he coached them, and he coaxed them into becoming a people after his own heart. God even decided that plan B was needed. Plan A was the garden. Plan B is the promised land. God set aside a perfect piece of property for the Israelites. Plan B was to take these chosen peoples and to have them live such good lives that all the world would know about him, the God who loves all of humanity. Plan B was very evident first with Moses leading the people out of captivity. And then, secondly, plan B was very evident with Yeshua, also known as Joshua, leading the people into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. But the Israelites quickly forgot about their God. They forgot about his providence. They forgot about his promises. They forgot his love. And they walked away and they took on other gods of their own choosing. You can imagine God's heartbreak. You can imagine God's anger and jealousy. 
And you know what he did? He sent the Israelites packing and he exiled them to Babylon. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Twice God provided for his people and twice he tried to dwell with his people and twice he was rejected. What is God to do? Well, if there is one thing that you need to know about God, it is this. God is love. That's right. God is love, and he cannot but help himself. His deep love overtakes him. He remembers his promises. He remembers his people. And so he initiated Plan C. Plan C began when he invited the people back to the promised land. And then he waited. He waited about 400 years. He waited until the time was just right. And then he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus was the new Moses leading people out of captivity. Jesus was the new Yeshua leading people into the promised land. Plan C is the new plan to allow God to dwell with his people. Plan C is what our opening text would call church. Church is the new promised land. Church is the new Garden of Eden. Church is God's new design for his dwelling among his people. After we walked away from plan A and after we walked away from plan B, God decided to take up residency in our hearts. <laughs> I mean, what better way or what better place to live than right inside of us? Because there's kind of no getting away from that now, is there? But plan C is not intended for each person to simply be a solitary temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3 says that we together are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God intends for his people to live in community and he intends to live with his people in that community. And church is that community temple, if you will. Matthew 16 says that Jesus would build his church on the rock of Peter. So if you would, please turn with me to Acts 2. Acts 2, and we're going to be looking at a few verses in there. Here we're going to see Peter begin to lay the foundations for the church. And we will see the coming of the Holy Spirit and the building of community, all that we call the church. Acts 2, 1 to 13, tell us the story of the coming of the Holy Spirit. We call it Pentecost. Acts 2, 14 to 41, tells us the story of how Peter, that is the rock, how he lays the foundation for church by preaching about Jesus. Peter then tells them that it is all on account of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And Peter tells them that they can once again walk with God that they can be reconciled to God by, by repenting of their waywardness, by accepting Jesus as their Savior and receiving the Holy Spirit. So let's pick up this story at verse 40, and we'll read to verse 47. It's right there at the end of Peter's sermon, and let's see what happens. With many other words, Peter warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and, his, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Thus far the reading of God's word. And all God's people said... We have just read of the first day of Plan C. 
It's beginning to take shape. The people repented from their waywardness. They accepted Jesus Christ. They received the Holy Spirit. And the church was born. Then take notice what happened next. Take notice how the church came together, how they formed community. Notice that salvation was not just about themselves, but notice how they banded together for the benefit of others. And the Lord added to their number daily, teaching and fellowship, bread and prayer, a focus on God and humanity, a community of God's people, the new Garden of Eden, the new promised land, the new plan, the local church. Notice how the church flowed with new milk and honey. Notice how the church flowed with power and authority. Notice how the church was flowing with love and generosity. Notice how the church flowed with love for God and love for people. The local church is God's plan C for making his dwelling among us. Plan C, the local church. It was Bill Hybels who coined the phrase, the local church is the hope of the world. And if you have ever listened to his journey of how he came to coin that phrase, you would know that when Bill was 17 years old, he thought the church was hopeless. The church could not do anything right. It was not living out its mandate as the new promised land. It was failing and falling at every turn throughout the centuries and in that current day. The church was hopeless. What about six years later, Bill began to change his tune. He started to see that there is hope for the local church. And he was confronted by the Acts 2 depiction of church that we just read. He was confronted with the challenge that if the church still believes in the Bible as the word of God, that, that if Jesus is who he says he is and that he can pierce people's hearts, and if the Holy Spirit is still God's choosing to dwell among us, then then there must be some hope that the church can devote itself to the Bible's teaching. Then there must be some hope that the fellowship of believers is for the benefit of all. Then there must be some hope that the breaking of bread still nourishes our soul and the body of believers. And that prayer is still the best way to talk to God. There is hope for the church if they still pursue love and generosity. There is still hope for the church if they continue to meet together with glad and sincere hearts. There is hope for the church if they continue to praise God. There is hope for the church. There is hope for the church because Jesus came to lead us into a new land. There is hope because Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is the sustainer of the church. There is hope because God still provides and promises his love. Do you believe that there is hope for the church? I suspect that you do. You are here, after all. Bill Hybels' journey took him from the church is hopeless to there is hope for the church to the local church is the hope of the world. So how did he get there? How did he make that last step? Well, one day, Bill was sitting in the airport of Sao Paulo, Brazil, and he witnessed two boys horsing around. They were fighting in the waiting area. One was nine years old and the other one was seven years old. And it all seemed harmless enough, you know, until somebody loses an eye. You know that phrase. Well, the older boy swung his fist in an intentional arc that aimed directly at the boy's nose and smacked him so hard that the boy fell over backwards and it was his head that hit the ground first. Then the nine-year-old got on top of the seven-year-old and he started to bang the, the little boy's head on the floor continually. Bill was aghast and he rushed over to separate those two boys. But just then the PA speaker called his name. Bill Hybels, the plane is waiting for you. 
Bill arranged for some locals to help these two boys out, and, and then he boarded his plane back home to Chicago. As the plane flew, Bill was still in shock about what happened. The rage in that nine-year-old boy was very evident. Something in his life had caused him to be full of rage. Perhaps he had been abused. Perhaps he had witnessed a, a beating, a, a, a killing. Something to cause him to seethe with anger. Bill figured that the boy's home environment was caustic. Hurt people hurt people. You know that, don't you? Hurt people hurt people. So Bill started thinking about the trajectory of this young boy's life. Would this boy with a hate-filled heart enter into school? Would he become an honor student, find a fulfilling job and, and a fantastic wife? Would he end up with a white picket fence and a ticket to heaven? <laughs> or if the boy is already pounding the head of vulnerable people, is he more likely in school to learn how to use knives and guns and then get arrested and, and rot in jail and go to hell? So Bill wondered, what could possibly, what power on earth could possibly change the trajectory of this boy's life from one foreseeable end to a hope-filled but right now unforeseeable end? Is it possible that the government would enact some legislation that would change the composition of this boy's heart? Uh-uh. Is it possible that the boy would enroll in some university class that would radically change his outlook, that fundamentally changes the composition of his heart? Doubtful. Will some businessman or woman develop a product that when bought and used would fundamentally change the composition of this boy's heart? Not likely. Bill reviewed these options and several others, and he came to the startling conclusion that the only way that this boy's heart might change is if some Christ follower from an Acts 2 type church is going to cross the paths with this boy, is going to reach out and grab the boy's shoulders and say to that boy, I know you must be hurting inside because of what has been done to you, but I want you to know that there is a love in heaven with your name on it. And the love of Jesus can fundamentally change your heart. His love, over time, can dispel all that hatred, all that anger, and the need for revenge. And I want you to know that our church will love you as you are. We will accept you as you are. And you can be a part of a church who love God and love each other. And who help each other towards wholeness. Bill came to the conclusion that if the love of Jesus is the only power that can fundamentally change the heart of this boy and many other people like him, that if it's true that this message has been entrusted to the local church and that if the church is the ministry of reconciliation that Jesus gave to us, then add it all up. And what do you get? The local church is the hope of the world. The local church is the hope of the world. Do you believe that? We are the local church, indeed. God uses the church to touch people's lives, whether they be nine or 29. God uses the church to touch middle-aged peoples and elderly seniors. God chooses to use the church to bring hope to the world. And now that you know that the local church is the hope of the world, I kind of want to push that just a little bit further to what that looks like for us today. Have you heard the phrase that our youth are the church of tomorrow? I find that phrase very invigorating, but also a little bit false. You see, I believe that our church has youth already and that I believe that our youth are the church of today. And I'd like to look closely at what that looks like. And if this is true, let's take a moment to ponder this 
And so I'd like to call upon three people to come up here. I'd like to invite a young adult to come up and stand here among us in front of us. A young adult, a 20-something-year-old, perhaps. Do I have a volunteer? I see somebody taking their coat off. Excellent. Come on up. I'd also like to invite a high school youth to come up here and to stand beside Rebecca. We're looking for a high school student here. I'm not going to ask you to do a dance or a ditty. Just stand. All right, we got one coming up from the back. And last, I'd like to call up a small child to come up here, and I'm going to ask Derek to come on up if he would. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Josh. And thank you, Derek. I specifically chose Derek because, do you know his story? His story is that he said, I want to go to that church. And so he dragged his grandma and said, hey, come on, let's go to this church. And so they're here. And they're coming and they're attending and they're a part of hope and, and they belong to, the, to God's family and they believe in Jesus Christ and they want to bless their neighbors. And so Derek, you've been instrumental in, in bringing people to church already, even at your young age. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> These are the youth of the church today. They are the church of tomorrow, you might say, but, but why put off till tomorrow what we can do today? And so Hope Fellowship Church, we need to demonstrate to them the power and authority of the church. We need to share with them the power and authority of the church. We need to demonstrate to them the love and generosity that the church has because we have a grateful heart because of what God has given to us. We need to show and demonstrate it to them so that they would know. You see, we are the church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Amen. Please join me in a short moment of prayer. Lord, you have set us apart for your plan C to be accomplished. You have created us for such a time as this. Lord, you created our youth for such a time as this. And we seek to be diligent about that. Lord Jesus, may your plan C come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.